Record. All right. Hey, everybody. It's uh, 5.02 my time. So um, I think we can go ahead and get started. Let me just share my screen. Might be a short one today. We have a f uh, not so many demos um, or not so many people doing demos. <clears throat> And also not a lot to cover on the intro slides. Um, really, there um, don't appear to have been any, any changes um, to the teams. So I'll just um, sort of fly through these slides. Um, really just reference at this point. Um, the other thing um, that we, of course, cover in the slides, if you want to refer back um, later on, is um, to the sprint highlights. So. Some of this will be covered in our demos and some of it won't be. Um, so if you just want to, you know, take a look at what the teams have been working on, every team has updated the slides with what um, some of the highlights of their past couple of sprints have been. And so all our teams. And with that, I think we can move right in to the actual demonstrations. I'll show you who's demoing today. We've got just four people from the core team. We've got Stax, Frontside, EBSCO, AtCult, and then Jakob will wrap us up with um, the uh, developments on the platform. So let's see, we've got Roman is, is up top on the core team list this week. Are you on, Roman? Maybe Roman's not on. Why don't we move to Nils Eric if he's there? I'm here. All right, cool. Let me stop sharing. sharing here. Hang on. Just need to grab my browser. Here it comes. All right. Uh, so you see uh, inventory uh, in, the, in the UI now? Yep. Good. Uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, some uh, refactoring we've done uh, with regards to uh, uh, the location of, uh, of uh, our holdings. Uh, until now, we've had uh, uh, that uh, on the holdings level, you could uh, find the location of uh, the items. So, uh, uh, for instance, here uh, for, for Bridget, the, the location for all the items would be the main library. And then uh, you had the options for each item to uh, say that uh, uh, this individual item is uh, uh, now in a, an, a new temporary location. Uh, so that functionality we kept, but expand, expanded it, extended it so that you can, uh, there was a desire to also be able to remove all items on block to a new temporary location as well as to say that an individual item is now in a new permanent location. So, so that required a few uh, new fields on, on both um, uh, the holdings and the items level and, and some logic to uh, figure out, uh, well, what's the, the actual uh, location of, uh, of, this, uh, of any uh, given item, uh, of course. So if uh, we look at the uh, at this uh, this holding, uh, uh, we we always had uh, this uh, permanent location, but now we have a, a temporary location as well. So, say we wanted to move all the uh, all the items of this uh, holding to a new uh, uh, temporary location uh, on block, we we could do that uh, here. So, say uh, all these items uh, belong to this holding record; they are now in in the in the second floor. Um, and, uh, and and here we have it. It's on the on the same floor. 
then for uh, individual items, uh, we can we can also say that uh, that we uh, want to operate on the item level. And if we look at this item, it it's uh, holding is uh, registered as being in the in main, main library, but it's temporarily in in the second floor. And since that applies to all items, it applies to this. Uh, Item as well. So here at the bottom we have you know, the actual location for the item, uh, which would be second floor. But for, for individual items, we can then uh, we can then override this. So we can say that this individual item, uh, as opposed to all the other items in the in the holdings, we want that to be in a different place uh, permanently. And and that we do by saying we. We move this to the annex and update the item, and and what happens here is then that uh, that uh, this setting the annex will override whatever was set on the on the holdings uh, level, and and the effective location for the items is thus uh, the the annex, and then uh, finally uh, the, the 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 already existing logic you do. You could say that uh, was that you could then for this individual item specify a, a, a temporary uh, location, and uh, you can still do that. And that, oh, what happened here? Um, temporary location. Oh, something went wrong here. I might have a problem. I just tried that a few uh, moments ago, but there is some uh, some update problem here. Uh, so what what it should so uh, show was that uh, the uh, effective location uh, thus became uh, the the reading room uh, for for this uh, particular item uh, down here. Uh, and that was the that was the uh, existing logic actually, but. Uh, uh, something happened when uh, when I did it, uh, did it here now, so so we'll have to get back to that. But but uh, anyway, that's the um, that's the, the the change to to the holding uh, to the location logic that we've been working on these sprints, and that was all. That looks really good, Nils. I um, now that I see it live, I'm wondering if that inherit from holdings. Um, is maybe a little confusing with a yeah. temporary location, yeah. Yeah, and maybe we also want to reflect the temporary location of the holdings up here instead of the permanent, if it's overridden, on the holdings level. Oh, so, yeah, good point. So that, that's kind of things. We've also been working on uh, the search uh, or the filtering. Uh, over here, the, the filtering should uh, really look for the, for the effective location of of uh, the items uh, and uh, and we have that that logic in place we have uh, been uh, uh, working on the on the performance uh, on creating the uh, performing queries for it but uh, but we're almost there but, but that's also something that uh, needs to be put in place now we have uh, the new uh, data structure yeah great so that's the work to that's do great. okay Thank you. Any questions for Nils? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so then we've got Mark Deutsch up next. Right on. Okay, I'm sharing. Looks good. So a few things um, new in this uh, in this sprint. Uh, the first one was kind of a a folio wide um, change with a bunch of moving parts and infrastructure, um, and that's that we've we've changed the titles now um, for the the tab titles and the browser um, window titles if uh, if applicable. 
Um, so now wherever you are in Folio, uh, the title will change um, based on that page. So no longer will you be hunting through your 20 tabs of Folio, Folio, Folio. Um, awesome. So these are actually uh, internationalizable strings. Um, the the module titles that we have here. So check out inventory. Um, that's a change as of this sprint. Um, we've changed slightly how uh, how we expect the format of the package files for the UI modules to look like. Um, so if you want more information about that, um, you can ping me. Um, but basically the gist of it is that now they are keys into the um, translations dictionaries um, rather than just a string that says checkout. Um, so that starts the infrastructure needed to, uh, to internationalize all the, all the module metadata like descriptions and, and long form titles and whatnot. Um, if we go into users or um, a module that has a record, then we also have the ability to show the currently uh, selected record in the title. So over here we've got Amparo's record open and we see that in the, reflected in the, in the title. Uh, likewise, if we go to inventory, we see the open uh, inventory uh, instance title in, uh, in, the, in the tab. One of the things that, uh, another thing that we did sort of folio wide was we streamlined how we're, we're showing this metadata here. Uh, previously, in some places, uh, the username was, uh, was a link, and in some places it was just plain text. So every place that, uh, that uses this little expandable accordion metadata is now going to contain a link to that user's record. Um, so if we click it, then it's not going to work because demos. There we go. Um, so that should work. And that sort of brings it back in line with, uh, with what we previously saw here in uh, the controlled vocabulary, where these uh, these usernames were always links. So that's that's definitely a lot of cleanup in our code base. And uh, the last thing that I was working on this sprint was the ability to cancel requests. So now, if we open up a request that we have here, then um, we see the little request title in the in the tab bar. With, uh, with our metadata here. But now we also have uh, the ability to open this dropdown and cancel the request. And these reasons for cancellation um, were plugged in manually by me um, right now. We're working on getting some, uh, some reasons, some canned reasons. Um, built in to the, to the bootstrap scripts. Um, but eventually they're also going to be editable via a controlled vocabulary page in the settings. But for now, this is what it looks like until the next refresh of folio stable. Um, and so whoever is canceling the request can just pick whatever they want. Um, and generally most of the reasons, will have some additional information you can optionally add in here, but you can also specify a reason um, that requires uh, additional information. So note that we've just changed from optional to required here and the confirm button is disabled. So if we require some additional information, um, then we can enter it here. And now we see that the request status is closed, canceled. That information has been reflected in the list as well. And uh, finally, uh, Matt Connolly's work 
to uh, disable editing of requests once they are closed is now visible because we do not have an edit button here and we no longer have a, a little drop down menu here to edit the request as well. So that's what we've got. Any questions? Actually, one quick question about the list of items or the list of reasons there for cancellation. Yep. I didn't ca quite catch that. You're saying that it will be editable, editable or just in a file, not in the UI? It will, yeah, it'll be editable in the UI. Um, so right now that, that functionality isn't available, um, that those stories haven't been written. Um, but eventually we're gonna have a controlled vocabulary similar to this where um, all the, the various uh, cancellation reasons can be uh, created, edited, uh, deleted over here. Um, and it'll also include a little checkbox for whether that cancellation reason requires additional info or not. I think you may, you may have some of us reaching out to you. This just resembles uh, what, what we're trying to do with closures for orders like very similar, your, your modal is almost identical to the one that we sort of mocked up that we're thinking for closing an order basically that you, you know, identify a reason and um, right. series of options and have to add a note. And if you specify, like if it's other, you have to add additional information. So on. it just, uh, it seems very close. So, so this would be great if we could chat with you about this. That's yeah, something. for sure. Yeah. Thanks very much. And this was Dennis at Stacks, by the way. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Mark. That looked really good. Um, I'm curious. I see Philip's on the call. I wonder if we have a um, like a rollout plan for. I saw that you had edit both in the menu when you click on the request name, or I think the request title plus the edit um, icon. Do we have a plan for, are we like now migrating away from the, the edit icon and we're going to start using that menu or um, what's, the, what's the plan there? Are you asking about the icons in the header versus the icons in the drop down? Yeah, exactly. Or the, the options in the drop down and the icons in the header. Um, so we want to move towards putting stuff in the, in the drop down and uh, Last time I discussed it with anyone with, was with Kalila and some others. And the conclusion, as I recall, was to put all we can in the drop down and keep for now the edit button in the header, but as a button. So maybe I should just draft something up and share it with everyone um, if there's confusion about that. Okay. Okay, good to know. It looks really nice. Uh, okay, so um, after Mark is Aditya. Are you on Aditya? Uh, yes, Kate. Oh, cool. I'm sharing right now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so one of the first things I worked on this print was uh, regarding the bulk renewal of loans. Um, so if you go to the open loans page, one of the users have three items checked out here. So we have had this bulk renewal of loans uh, functionality in place for some time now, but uh, only recently have we basically implemented the logic for various reasons why this renewal could fail. Um, so that means that you would want to provide the ability to show a confirmation message or a pop-up that tells the user like which of the renewals have failed and succeeded and the reasons behind why they've failed. So suppose I select all the loans here and try renewing them. So you get this new model pop-up with the header of renew, renew confirmation. It says two items not renewed, one item successfully renewed. And for the, for the renewals that have failed, once you click on this, uh, exclamation mark, you can see that loan cannot be renewed because you, you, you get the reason why the loan has, the renewal has failed. This uh, reason is basically the same reason when you would individually renew the loan, for example, like this. 
So this is the same reason that you can see there. Um, so that's, so I think that's it for this uh, story. And the second one, it's, it's on the same page. It's the column selector pattern. So it's just a pattern that we developed from the already existent components we have in our library. Um, the purpose of this is to selectively display the columns on the UI. Basically, when this list exceeds the page width, for example, uh, like so, and you would, and the user would want to see only specific columns. You can just select them from here and just work on this instead of scrolling horizontally. So this was the second one. And I worked on like a couple of bugs. Uh, it's not bugs exactly, but uh, so in the user's app, like wherever you use search and sort, initially, this header here said zero records found even when we haven't started the search yet. But now it says enter search criteria to start the search. So when you enter something, then you get the list of the results. But then when you take it off, you again get enter search criteria to start search just for a better understanding. And the next one is, yeah. So this is a long, long standing bug where uh, you had to click the back button twice to get back to the previous page. Me and uh, Mihail primarily worked on this issue. So now on a single click, you can get back to the previous page across all the apps as well. So that's been fixed. Nice. Yeah, so that's it for me. Any questions? Looking really polished. Thank you, Aditya. I know we're a pain when we're trying to test the multiple reasons for not being able to renew. It's really hard to get the scenario set up right in the test uh, manual testing to, to get multiple reasons to show up at the same time. With the column selection, is that part of the stripes widget now? Like, could that show up on this screen, selecting columns? Yeah, we could add it, but uh, it's currently only on the open loans page. Ah, uh, okay. I think the POs are going to look at all their you know, any screens that have tables and determine if it makes sense. I think there are probably lots of places where it could be useful. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's the component that started its life with Stacks. I think Stacks developed that one and then made it available to everybody, so. That's uh, what I was gonna ask. It, is that the Stacks uh, base or is that a, another one, a different one from the Stacks one? Um, this is different from the Stacks one. Oh, is it? Yeah. Interesting. It looks the same, <laughs> but I guess that's a good thing. <clears throat> All right. Anything else for Aditya? Okay. If not, then I guess we're on to um, Dennis and Stacks. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to, so myself, Arvin, John Comic, uh, Kevin Hork here, Dennis, this is Dennis here. We're gonna try and just highlight a handful of things from vendors, finance, and touch a little bit on orders. We're gonna show a few things, but uh, we also kinda wanna highlight some of the issues or challenges that we're facing <clears throat> and see if we can stir up some conversation and, and you know, hopefully some, some other people have been talking about these things somewhere or other. Um, so the first thing we're gonna show vendors, We've made actually a handful of updates here based on some of the feedback that we're getting from the community. And we're getting ready to start our first official UAT for vendors on Monday. Ideally, we've got all the participants we need by Friday. And, and so getting, getting ready for that, we've made some 
major refinements. Of course, the search and filter that Arvin is showing now along the left-hand side of the screen, I think we've briefly shown this update, but the ability to filter by a whole bunch of different things has been added based on the analysis we've done. And then the ability to search by specific fields as well, like you've seen elsewhere with that uh, search and filter component. So we're taking advantage of some of that. We, in the vendor record, have a country field and a language field that are still causing us some grief, um, essentially slowing down the interface a little bit. And so we had them off for, for a time. We're trying to figure out exactly how we might work our way around this issue. Um, but I've turned them back on for UAT. And so you may notice that uh, if we open some of these records and we're editing or updating uh, new entries that, yeah, things move a little bit slowly. I'm not sure if there's anything specific you want to say about that. Uh, no, it's just the form. When you're trying to fill out the form, just make things really not unresponsive, but like delay. There's a big delay on that one. That's why we turned it off for, uh, for weeks. And the, and the core of this may be, like we're just loading a huge stream of data? Or? Um, we're just trying to load um, the, the country and um, the languages. That was the, um, like the main thing that I noticed on that one. I tried to refactor my code, but still, still I'm having that issue. So I don't know, I might ask the core too on how yeah. we could uh, handle that one. So we know that there's some larger lists than users and other modules. So if anyone's dealt with a similar issue in like these long lists, select lists, slowing the interface down, please let us know. Next thing that we might show are the date and time. So with vendors, we've tried, tried to move over to more standard components. And one of them is this date and time selection. And I think there was a bit of challenge getting this to submit properly, but yeah, um, the challenge was um, I didn't know that uh, I need to <laughs> submit uh, date and time together. Um, basically, the uh, module accepts the whole date and time. So I was trying to figure that out. And I need to convert it in my local, not only in my local, but in the user's local. Um, that was working. So when you update this one, um, so that was one of the problems too that the users have been having, if the um, form is not collapsed, it will not show the error and they will like, what is going on? The problem is there is the required field. Uh, we need to do a better, um, what do you call it, show it better. What are the required fields that needs to fill up? Yeah, essentially highlighting the errors. So when you've forgotten to fill or you haven't filled a required field, we have so many accordions and we're not, we don't have a mechanism for showing that within a certain accordion, you have missed a field. Um, so the thinking would be that we find a way to show that, you know, highlight an accordion, the entire accordion in red or something so that you know that one of the fields within this accordion is required and has not been filled. And so you can sort of chase those errors down. But now he's showing, yeah, once you, <laughs> overcome that, you can find the date and time and it's uh, submitting correctly. That is an interesting one. We, I know that we've done something elsewhere where um, it will automatically scroll to the section of the form that has the validation error. But yeah, yeah. we never thought through what to do when, the, um, when it was collapsed, the section. Yeah. I never tested that either. Yeah, I remember testing when, when you've got one or more errors or when you have one or more required fields not filled in and you go to save, it will take you to the first one that's a problem and highlight it. Yeah, right. which, which is great. And the only, but the only issue is you, if you have a, a handful that you've missed, uh, right, there may be some in other accordions that you've now got to figure out where that error is or continue submitting you know, fix the error, submit, and then get put in that field, fix that, submit, get put in the next one. So we've got to figure out a, a way to 
that kind of communicate those errors a little yeah. bit better. Well, this is, hi, it's John here. This is also an, an issue that we'll probably see more of as the lists get longer, as in like the orders module, yes. where you have a, a purchase order with multiple lines, and each one is basically uh, its own accordion. Yeah. So a larger list would just exasperate the problem a little more. So we can find a, a solution that kind of tackles medium lists and larger lists of accordions that would kind of be uh, useful. So if anyone's been working on that in their spare time, let us know. <laughs> um, the next thing that we wanted to highlight, the search and filter for finance. So we're moving to the finance module. Now for ledgers, funds, budget, and fiscal year, you can see that there are a variety of options for filter and search. This is based on the analysis that we've done with the uh, smaller group and SIG as well. Uh, so we've configured search and filter for finance. And I think we're now seeing finance in testing, right? Um, I think so. I, don't know. I believe I believe it is there. Mod's there, but I don't think UI yet. So that, that should be coming soon. We're looking forward to seeing that in testing as well. And then the last thing we'll mention, maybe just pop in orders. Uh, so we, we've run into some issues building orders because a lot of the work that we've been doing in this sprint is um, essentially refactoring the, the mod orders to align more closely with the other modules that we built. This was like the first module that we took a swing at and then we've now come back to it to have it be included and we've been working on the UI at the same time. So you'll see a few new things in the UI here that we didn't show the other day, mostly with to do at the top here with, uh, so fund distribution you're seeing is part of the summary information for this order. And then the ability to check in, receive, order, save, order, these, these buttons and the total price and so on. Um, so some of this relates to receiving, you can even maybe click on receiving. No, it's not your um, fund, but, but yeah, essentially if you're, so we're working on the receiving portion of the user interface and orders and just trying to resolve a few issues with it building properly so that we can submit it to the testing environment and uh, have the majority of our modules actually appear there. So that's, that's exciting. The last thing maybe that we'll touch on are, I'm not sure if it's gonna be overly interesting to any of you, but we've, we've done a lot of work on how payments and credits will function how the transactions or how, I guess, monetary values are gonna move through the system. And this may affect those of you who are doing development in other modules that might need to create a payment or uh, a credit for one reason or another, maybe fees, fines, uh, some of the things that we've been running into. So I, maybe I'll just draw your attention that we do have a mock-up of how this works. I'm gonna just steal this from here. Can you see up here? Sure. So this guy. So we, we just <clears throat> we've updated the workflow as far as um, when you've got your ledgers, your funds, your budgets. And we create a purchase order with purchase order lines. When that order is actually sent, it will generate encumbrances. This sort of moves you through you have encumbrances and then you invoice something which creates payments and these payments generate transactions that fulfill your encumbrances. Um, this also describes how you can allocate or transfer money between budgets and so on. So I won't go into major detail on this because um, it only applies to some of you, but we have done a lot of analysis on, on these transactions and how they're gonna function. So uh, that's, that translates into a handful of updates to our ERDs, mostly to the finance, ERD orders orders inventory or sorry invoicing possibly I believe yeah um, so that's that's it for us and this is Anne Marie I just wanted to say thanks to the core folks that have helped to get some of this stuff up and running in uh, testing and snapshot stable the the RM sig has been uh, waiting anxiously for ha to have something that they can play with and work with uh, acquisitions related and this 
the, the vendors and the sample data for vendors is the first time people have actually been able to start playing with anything. And we've, we've had a discuss post going, we've got a ton of good feedback. Like Dennis said, we're about to start user acceptance testing. So it's been really nice to, to, to finally have something that we can work with and we're looking forward to having more of them come, come to life soon. Hey Dennis, this is uh, Vince. Quick question for you: um, the the flowchart diagram you have and, and other outputs from the analysis. Uh, any chance we could have those up on the the wiki? Yeah. Yes. Um, no, no. Sorry. Yes, we've been uploading those to the acquisition small group uh, pages. Sometimes they're included in notes, but um, I can make sure that the pages that represent orders, invoicing, um, you know, the various modules that we have have updated ERDs and so on. Okay, including the, di the, flow, the flow diagram you just showed? Yes, yeah, for sure. We can uh, post this as well. That's awesome, thanks. You bet. Anything else for Dennis? All right, thanks, Dennis. Um, front side guys are up next. Howdy. Howdy. Ship screen. All right, there we go. Um, so, feature development uh, of eHoldings has been kind of slowing down a little bit because uh, at this point we're pretty close to feature parity with EBSCO's holdings and link manager. So, I won't be showing a whole lot of new feature work. Instead, the focus of our work lately has been polishing these interactions and adopting as much of Stripe's components as possible. So for every Stripe's components that we need to use in eHoldings, we're addressing automated test coverage, bugs, and accessibility issues. So a few of the big wins there, I'll show you in the uh, Stripe's components storybook environment, are that uh, in the text field, uh, searching, uh, typing anything, uh, you can now clear it again. Uh, that was broken for a while. There's no longer a CSS Z index problem with modals uh, in eHoldings. So we'll be adopting the Stripes components modal upstream in eHoldings. Uh, actually, that's happening this front. Uh, and then uh, we also have storybook examples now for the date picker and the time picker. And you see we had added some of this, these handy tools into storybook where we can easily see the left to right version of all these components. And we can also switch, actually I'll show that on a date picker, we can switch with Shokal, let's look at Hungarian. It's pretty cool. Uh, we can see all that, makes it a lot easier to, to iterate fast on these components. So uh, over the past couple months, we've upped the test coverage in Stripe's components from, we started at zero a couple months ago to almost 50% now. So uh, big shout outs to Will from Frontside, John Coburn and EBSCO and Erasmus at Sanghang for, for really doing a lot of this, this work and making major contributions to the, the effort. You can see we still got a long way to have all these either yellow or green. Uh, there's still a lot of work there to, to really get to the, the quality level of comfort that, we're, that we want uh, with these components. So hopping over to eHoldings, uh, where we're adopting these, these components as we get them to, to good quality levels. Uh, I wanna show some changes that we've been making to packages and package titles. So previously, uh, when you would open up a package view like this, nearly every editable thing on here, you could actually edit on this screen. Uh, we're changing that. Um, we've changed that over the past couple months to uh, align closer to what other folio modules are doing, where uh, Mark was showing there's now an edit link here. We also have that in the holdings. We're, we're adopting that pattern. Uh, and you can also hit edit here to edit there. So go ahead, going back, um, the one thing that we're retaining that you can, the action that you can take on this page is to add to holdings. So previously, uh, this was a toggle switch uh, like is shown here. Um, I'll go ahead and hit that there, demonstrate how that works. Let's uh, continue without saving. So here to, for clarity, we're actually changing this to a button. Um, so it's, it's no longer so much an on or off situation. There are situations where you have a partially selected package and you want to be able to add the entire package to holdings. So for clarity there, we've changed this UI. Now it's simply a button that says add to holdings. This is the primary action that takes place in the eHoldings app. So let's go ahead and add that. 
Great, now it is selected. Now you see that there's no way here to remove it from your holdings. That's because uh, based on user feedback, we realized that adding to holdings is a much more common interaction than removing from holdings. So to remove from holdings, use this pane header context menu. You see remove from holdings is now there. Let's do that. Uh, <laughs> this is a destructive action. So we, we pop up a model. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, let's remove it. And you'll see that now it's not selected anymore and we can add it back to the holdings. So any questions on that stripes components or holdings work? Okay, uh, so another big rock that we've been tackling is how to accessibly root focus uh, in a single page JavaScript app portfolio, and I will hand it over to Charles to demo that. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, and <clears throat> once everybody can see my screen, just, uh, yes, yeah, okay, great. So um, today we're going to, um, or I'm going to be showing a little bit of folio from the perspective of uh, accessibility. Um, so what I want to demonstrate today is um, the high level navigation. Um, there still is actually a lot of detail work to be done uh, around uh, accessibility, but um, what we're gonna be kind of demonstrating is just kind of the fundamental usage of the application. Um, so to do this, um, I'm actually um, going to be uh, using uh, voiceover on the Mac, it's a little bit confusing if you've never seen it used before. Um, but if, you know, uh, so I've, I've got it to slow down. Um, so it should be intelligible. But if you have any questions about keyboard navigation, about voice navigation, just go ahead and stop me. And we can go ahead and, and you know, answer any of those questions. Because um, it's definitely a different mode of interacting with the application that you're used to. Um, so um, to, to kind of demonstrate how uh, it, the, the navigation is bo uh, broken right now, um, I went ahead and checked out on my local machine an older version uh, of the app. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to kind of demonstrate these problems. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, the, the, the voiceover. Voiceover on Safari. Folio, window, search packages, search text field, search packages, has keyboard focus. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. Okay, so hopefully everybody heard that. Um, and uh, like I said, let me know uh, if, we, if you didn't hear it. Um, so now if you're, you, you heard that, um, and you have to imagine that that's the only thing that you can hear. Uh, you can, you've got your keyboard to put information into the application and you have your ears to put, to take information out. And if you're really brave, you're actually going to close your eyes uh, and see this, this entire demonstration. And I'll tell you what I'm doing. Um, uh, and the voiceover will tell you what we're doing and, and I'll tell you what's happening on the screen. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's an optional. So I'm going to search for packages with ebooks. B O ebook. So you are currently O. Okay. Ebook O O O ebook S. So you can you see that currently on the voiceover field. users also to get trolled by auto in this field type ebooks. O okay. S misspelled ebooks ebooks suggested correction. Okay. E B O O K S. So I, what happened there is I entered in ebooks, I hit uh, enter, but you notice nothing actually happened. There was no announcement uh, that the search results returned. There was no announcement uh, of how many search results there were and there was, there's no announcement of what it is that I can do next. So um, from the perspective of someone using this assistive technology, the application state hasn't changed. Um, and so I can explore and kind of button. You are search button. I can navigate horizontal through the roll. filters. You are heading level three, sort relevance, relevance, package, radio button, package, heading level three, all selected. And so 
you know, from the perspective, the only thing that I know is I entered in this search and then now I'm going down into uh, drilling into packages. And so if I really wanted, if I was going to do a lot of work, oh, just, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump through all of these, all of the search filters to get over to the um, result list, which is there. Each eager print print up online on un, now adding level two packages. 1,772 search results. You are currently on a heading level two. So now if I, that was a lot of work to get over there. Um, and it wasn't clear that that is my next subject of interest is this result list. I enter in a search, I want to analyze the search results. Um, and so I had to do a lot of work to go over there. So now I'm going to navigate to the third item into the list. Object 1000 and blank, blank, ebook 724 digital content not selected, blank, ebooks for FE slash E collection, EBSCO ost, EBSCO not selected, blank, Springer ebooks, Kluwer ebooks 1983, 2006, CSUC, Springer nature not selected. You are currently on a link. To click this link, Press control option space. Okay, so now I'm going to click. I'm on the the record for Springer ebooks on the search results, and I want to click that link to drill down into the package. Okay, so now I click that link, and from the perspective uh, of an, a you know uh, someone using voiceover, nothing happened. Um, so, uh, you know, absolutely nothing happened. I completely and totally lost my context. Now this list is an infinite scrolling list. I could have, in this case, I've got 1700 results. And the only way to actually navigate over to that detail record on the right is to scroll through 1700 results, um, which is not a very usable um, thing. So I'm going to go ahead and like, let's say, I mean, no one would ever, I mean, essentially we've, the, the app is broken uh, over at this point, but. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, just manually navigate over to uh, the Springer selected the detail record. You are currently on a heading level two. Okay, so now let's say that I wanted to go back, like I did manage in some way to go back to get to this record. Let Spring visited if, link. If I want to go back to this link that says close Springer ebooks, okay. I can click on this, but then once again, nothing happens. Um, and you can see here that the focus is basically lost. It's gone into limbo. Um, and so the application from the perspective of someone trying to use this is completely and totally, uh, you know, un, un, undetermined. Um, and um, so what's interesting about this is that you know, what we've been doing is here is, is trying to track the context and we keep losing the context. But what's interesting about this is that part of the context is where you were coming from. Uh, and so, you know, we need to be able to, to track that. So there's, these are some of the, the, the fundamental navigational problems uh, that existed before uh, here um, that just make the application pretty much unusable. Um, so I'm going to go over to, uh, I guess I should stop. Are there any questions? No questions, but I sure hope you have a solution. <laughs> okay, well, so. Search packages, search text field, search packages, main. Okay, you so. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. Okay, so here we are. This is the actual production version of the application. And we're going to execute the exact same workflow uh, except on, on production. So we're going to enter in a search for ebooks. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, okay. Yes. Ebooks. 1,772 search results. You are currently on a heading level two. Okay. So notice the difference there is I entered in the search results. Um, it wasn't silent. It told me exactly how many search results I had and told me where I was. I was on the packages. And now if I navigate with the keyboard. 1,772 search results. You I can, are currently on a text element. I can go over. End of visited link plus new link. 
Ebook 724 Digital Content Not Selected, Link. Ebooks for FE slash E Collection, EBSCO Ust, EBSCO Not Selected, Link. Springer Ebooks, Kluwer Ebooks 1983, 2006, CSUC, Springer Nature Not Selected. You are currently on. So you can see um, that the navigation there, it kept me in context. So now if I actually click on this link, like we did before, Heading level two, Springer eBooks, Kluwer eBooks 1983, 2006, CSUC. You are currently on a heading level two. And so you can see, and now I'm actually focused over on the record, um, and I can navigate the- Heading level three, package information, provider, link, Springer nature, content type, eBook. You are currently on a text element. So then, uh, you know, I, I can start navigating the, the detail record directly because that's essentially what we do is we start navigating it with our eyes the moment we click on it from the result list. Now, if I close, again, we said that part of this context is where we came from. So if I go back up. Link. Spring visited. Link. Close Springer eBooks. Kluwer eBooks 1983. 2006. CSUC. So if I actually click on the close link. You can see link Springer eBooks, Kluwer eBooks, 1983, 2006, CSUC, Springer Nature Not Selected, Maine. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press Control Option Space. Uh, and that's and that's it. So, but but the key thing is at each point. Folio maintained my context and it was understanding what the object of interest was. Um, so um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's um, one of the things that's, that's nice about this is, you know, it allowed us to kind of develop, begin to develop um, uh, a, uh, a more of a nested information architecture because really, you know, what your application about is about is you know having or your your user interface is about is having these subjects of interest and being able to reason about what is the current subject of interest what's the current like current you know object that i'm looking at and more important than that is how do these subjects of interest relate to each other in terms of navigability like what subjects of interest can i reach from one subject of interest and what is the dependency graph? In other words, if I'm looking at one subject of interest, what are the subject of interest from which I, I came from? Um, and that's important, not just for accessible applications, but for any type, of, uh, app, any type of interface where you can only communicate one subject of interest at a time. And so we actually get spoiled with, uh, you know, with, with big desktop applications because we can, we can parse multiple subjects of interest, but that's not the case for um, you know, people using a voiceover, for example, but it's also the case for people using something like Siri or people using something like Amazon Alexa um, or someone using a mobile device where you can only show one screen uh, at a time. And so having that information ar inf architecture be kind of deeply represented in the application uh, means that you have that, that flexibility. So anyway, hopefully this has been a uh, eye opening or I guess an eye closing experience. Um, and uh, that's it. That was a powerfully good demo. Thank you. Yeah, that was great, Charles. And great work. And I'm sure this can, I would imagine this could serve as an example for other apps. You know, we can yes. take a look at what you guys have done here and try to replicate it elsewhere. Yeah, so uh, on that, like we have uh, part of oh, our system. Always lead on to X1, system dialing yeah. joke and voice over off. <laughs> Let me, t I'll turn my um, the voice over off uh, there. And um, yes, one of our, one of the things that we're, we've done this, uh, this sprint is generate a document uh, detailing how we did this uh, so that it can be replicated. Perfect. Cool. Thanks so much. Let's see, we've still got three demos left. Um, so EBSCO is next. With Varun and Craig. You guys on? Or maybe not. Um, let's then. Oh, we're here. oh, you're there. Okay. 
Hi. Oh, uh, we, we can't share our screen. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> Hi, uh, you can see our screen? Yes. Thank you. So uh, this is Varun. So uh, up until now, uh, we have completed uh, mod inventory storage and mod circulation storage modules by writing JMeter scripts to analyze performance. So uh, since our last meeting, we have observed almost 30% performance improvement for mod inventory storage module. So this is a good work, and uh, we should continue doing this. This will definitely help us as we scale up various parameters such as uh, total number of records and uh, the number of concurrent users. So, but moving further uh, for the mod circulation storage, there are latency issues with uh, various APIs. So we have a, a Jira tickets opened and there's still a work in progress. So the uh, performance trend graph in this slide is, is just a placeholder uh, to show how Jenkins plots it. Uh, it does not represent any specific scenario, so just FYI. Uh, so uh, we, are moving, we are monitoring performance for uh, 100 concurrent users, which are triggering approximately 15,000 HTTP requests. We are running Jenkins, uh, we, are, we are running nightly Jenkins job. Uh, this Jenkins job is set to fail even if a single HTTP request fails. And uh, so with Jenkins job triggers, uh, the JMeter scripts are running on top of PostgreSQL environment. So this is a PostgreSQL 9.6. So every day a Jenkins job is scheduled uh, to first create an environment by pulling in the latest release from uh, folio.org repository. Then uh, it runs all the Jenkins. Uh, then it runs all the JMeter scripts, and eventually it tears down the environment. So, uh, so this is the workflow that we are following. Once done, uh, this will generate a performance report, which will include a performance graph. And on analyzing the results through performance trend, we see that uh, the trends can be narrowed down to performance report. Uh, which subsequently can be narrowed down to individual HTTP request and response latency times. So we can actually go down and look at each request and what's the response time for it. So, uh, so we, we have contributed all our work to community, which involves like 20 JMeter scripts up until now, and we'll continue uh, working on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, below are the list of uh, the closed Jira's and the newly opened Jira's. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Hi, Craig here. Um, so today I'll be presenting some of the work that we've done um, for integration with Folio and the EBSCO Discovery Service, or EDS. Uh, more specifically, the patron functionality, which allows um, a user that's logged into EDS to perform some self-service actions, um, see what their current loans are, renew loans, that sort of thing. Um, there are several pieces involved here. Um, they're highlighted green. So uh, there's an Edge API, Edge Patron, which works similar to Edge Artec, which was uh, presented last sprint review. Uh, Mod Patron, which is a business logic module, um, which is used to gather information from various other modules in Folio, mod circulation, inventory, fees, fines, et cetera. And then finally, the third piece of work here was there was some integration work needed on the discovery service side, um, namely a, a service that actually calls our edge API. So I'll go through the flow real quick and then I'll, um, I'll give the actual demo. So the flow starts with a user logging in or signing in um, to EBSCO discovery service via single sign-on. Um, and as part of that, um, they get back some SAML attributes, including one that's sort of like an external system ID. Um, once logged in, EDS sends a request to uh, the ILS, Folio in this case, uh, to get that patron's account information. Um, and so you can see that 
here I have listed it sends in the API key as well as that external patron ID. Um, just like I showed last week, the, the Edge API obtains an exo copy token um, either from cache or by retrieving credentials from a secure store and logging into a copy. Um, and then it needs to do some additional work um, in that uh, it needs to map this external patron ID to sort of the internal uh, patron ID or user ID that's used within Folio. Um, so it does that by querying mod users um, against the external system ID attribute. Um, and then it caches that mapping so you don't have to do it on every, on every request. So now that I have a token and a, and a Folio user ID, I could then call mod patron to get the account info. Um, it gathers a bunch of info from various modules and then returns it um, where it's presented um, on, on the screen to, um, to the patron via the discovery service itself. So this flow is, is essentially the same for other calls. This is, you know, um, in this example is a get account info. Um, it, it would be the same flow for say renew alone, which is what I'll be showing in a minute. So let me hop over to. Can I, this is Mike Garof. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So are you thinking that the, I'm trying to follow uh, Folio versus sort of where the line is between Folio and, and the EBSCO discovery service? And I'm wondering if you're thinking that Edge Patron and Mod Patron would be things that would be contributed back to Folio or are those more of services that you built from an EBSCO EDS perspective that would interact with Folio? So they've been contributed back to Folio org. Um, they're currently in GitHub. Um, there are Jira -ish, um, projects for both of them as well, though most of the development work here happened before those projects were created. It was sort of tracked internally to EBSCO. But we plan on using those Jira projects going forward for uh, bug fixes and new features. Um, was there something that wasn't in Okapi that um you needed to build out through the Edge Patron and Mod Patron? So the reason why we need to, we need the Edge API is because a lot of these, uh, the discovery services don't have, uh, they don't currently support logging into uh, the ILS with a username and password. So the authentication flows. Um, so that's why we needed to provide um, sort of an Edge API that, that takes essentially just an API key um, and then logs in to a copy on behalf of that caller. Um, and I, I went over this last time at the last print review, but we're using what we're terming institutional users. So each tenant would have one or more of these institutional users that forms actions on behalf of the Edge API caller. Um, and so their credentials are stored encrypted in a secure store. There's a couple different options there. Um, and so when a request comes in, the API key is used to determine who the tenant is. Um, and then we then look up, you know, do we have a token in the cache already? If we do, we just use that token on the request. If not, then we go to the secure store, we get that institutional user's um, credentials, log into Folio, get the token, cache it, and then we can make calls into, uh, into Folio on behalf of, of that original caller. Does that make sense? Uh, mostly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Craig, I, I have a, Jacob here from Index Data, I have a question. So, do you guys maintain that institutional user in, in the folio, in a copy mod users effectively? No, that needs to be provisioned and maintained outside of, of, uh, of folio. Um, and right now, the edge APIs that we have don't do any, it's a read only um, sort of access, so that needs to be set up outside, it needs to be provisioned separately. Um, here at EBSCO for, for this demo, we're using the AWS Param store to store the credentials. That's our, the secure store we're using. Um, there's also another one that's been contributed to the community for um, using Vault, uh, which is an open source product uh, by HashiCorp, I believe. Um, and so, you know, you'd have to set that up um, separate, essentially. So maybe the question, Craig, this is Vince, is um, if, Folio were extended to support the concept of an institutional user, could we make use of it? Um, I, don't, I don't follow that, Ben. So we have provision an institutional user, and it's just a user that has certain privileges that we uh, maintain with inside Folio. 
And all we're doing is just the same thing you do when you log in via the API or the login screen. It's just a, a, a post to auth login. Right. But, okay, maybe I misunderstood Yaka's question then. And my second question, Craig, is uh, did you guys consider a situation where you would be essentially logging into Folio using using a using an SSO endpoint rather than you know maintaining the user directly in Folio? Um, so that wasn't um, that wasn't a scenario that we were required to handle at least initially. Um, the reason being that the user already logs into the EDS service via SSO. And so then having to log in to Folio via SSO is, is somewhat redundant. Um, Ideally, in this case, we're using the same identity provider, right? Yes, well, redundant from the from the point of view of uh, you know using the EDS, but obviously Folio has has support for SSO, so it would feel natural to use SSO if that user is already being authenticated through an SSO. Right, but this follows the pattern um, that's already established uh, with other discovery services or, or EDS interacting with OCLC's WMS in that, you know, you may have SSO that's being used in EDS in the discovery layer, but the ILS or the LSP in the background may or may not use that same uh, ID for that equivalent or that same patron. So this follows that pattern. Sure, sure, but you know, I think may or may not is the is the core element here, right? It needs to support also the case where it does use that uh, provider. Yeah, just a broad question. I think you know probably we we should discuss this outside of the meeting. But yeah, thanks. Okay, so I'll jump into uh, the demo then. So first, I'll just bring up. Uh, EDS, and I apologize if this part of this is slow, and that's because this is just running on a test server right now. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, do you want to sign in? And this brings us to our ugly, very generic uh, login page. I apologize for that. We log in as a patron. <coughs> And so now I'm logged in. You can see it says my Epsco Discovery Service. And just came back with my checkouts now appears up here. And so it shows that there are 10. That information was actually retrieved by going through that flow that we I, I walked you guys through. So that was the get account information. So then if I want to click on that, I can see what the actual loans are. Here they are. And so you can see there are 10 of them. And so here's, here's the information that comes back from the patron at JPI, and that is you know, due date. There's a renew button for renewing the loan. Um, and then there's the real-time availability information down here with the location, call number, status, due date, et cetera. Um, so again, all this information has come back from the at JPIs. Um, the last thing I kind of want to show is the ability to do renewals through this. So you can see that the Velveteen Rabbit, for instance, is due on 725. I click Renew. It says Renewal Confirmation. So this will reload in a moment, and we'll see that the due date has been bumped up by one month. Now it's 825. Oops. Um, and so this actually um, does go through all the loan policies and everything, which I had set up to have a max of one renewal. So if I click this again, um, it should deny me. Right now, it's just a generic message. Uh, we're working right now to have, you know, provide better error messages and some mapping between the statuses that come back from the NJPI and uh, the EDS messages themselves. Um, so that's probably work that will be demonstrated at a, at a later sprint review. Uh, also in the works is um, integration with fees and fines, um, and eventually the ability to place and delete and possibly edit holds as well. 
Um, there's a couple sticking points why we can't do that yet, but I won't get into that. So that's all I have to show. Um, a special thanks. I know that I, I presented this work, but um, Martin Tran and Matt Reno uh, also worked on this, so they deserve some credit. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Craig. That looks great. Are there any questions? All right. Um, then let's um, go straight into AtCult. Christian Chiama is going to show us some stuff. And then if we have time afterwards, Jakob, we can do your platform update. Otherwise, we'll just have to share the slides. Is Christian on the call? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, I share my screen. Okay. Uh, for okay, one moment, please. <laughs> okay, for the for the cataloging module uh, in this mount. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, some functionality, uh, functionality that uh, uh, is related uh, template and uh, uh, searching. <laughs> uh, in, the, the, in the settings uh, section, uh, we can see uh, a left menu with the cataloging uh, item. Oh, okay. And uh, as an item of a menu, uh, there is a logical view. A logical view uh, that we call the uh, we call uh, uh, database view is a, a database. In this section, we can choose a database on a drop-down menu with the autocomplete uh, functionality. Uh, for this, for instance. Uh, and then we choose uh, a, a database. In this section, uh, there is, a, for the moment, uh, this uh, only uh, one functionality. After that, uh, there is the, this is a, a central uh, application. For, uh, for our goal, um, we, can, we have uh, developed uh, a left menu um, Mm, on the on the left menu that uh, we can uh, uh, as we can see uh, we have two uh, two type of menu uh, a small menu and a large menu uh, on the left menu uh, we can uh, choose uh, on an advanced search in this section, uh, we uh, develop uh, a, a search functionality. Uh, in, this sec in, the, in this section, we, ca we can see a one drop down. In this drop down, we can choose uh, uh, some heading type, uh, for instance, a name, subject, or another kind of uh, information. Then uh, there is another. Uh, uh, there, uh, mm. um, really? no, excuse, excuse me. there is another uh, drop down, <laughs> drop down, uh, and then uh, the combine of uh, these two uh, drop down, uh, we uh, create uh, a query uh, on the text box. After that, we can shoot the, the button on the bottom, and we can uh, create. Uh, uh, a, a query uh, more uh, complex uh, thanks uh, a, a button on the bottom. Mm. Uh, in, in the top of this section, there is a two uh, radio button, a button with the primary, a button with the secondary. This radio button uh, represents a, a particular index uh, of, uh, of the database. Uh, is a related um, a, a selection of primary or secondary check uh, radio button. Uh, the second uh, drop down, uh, for instance, uh, 
Okay, <laughs> I found the solution. Uh, for instance, if we choose the second uh, radio button and uh, at the first drop down, we choose the doc document physical content, and in the second drop down, we choose uh, a second uh, a first item in the drop down, uh, compare a, a third drop down. In this drop down, uh, there, is, there are uh, all language can we should for to build a query, for instance. And uh, when we choose uh, one of these uh, in the text box, uh, we can create uh, an, a, a query that uh, in, this, in this moment, uh, the query is not, uh, <laughs> is not, uh, is not clear. Okay, on the uh, template management voice uh, in the menu, uh, we, can, uh, we can see uh, a, a template uh, functionality. In the central section, uh, when we choose uh, a one of item of uh, this, uh, uh, this table is a, is a normal uh, component um, folio table is open uh, a third diciamo, panel uh, uh, in accord with the, with the folio, folio, folio layout and the three folio layout. In the, the first section, there is a, there is a, a simple uh, diciamo, information about the, the template selected. And in the second section, uh, we can see a, a, a mandatory table related the template the selected. Uh, always in the, this section, uh, on top the right, there are two icons. An icon is a, a gear for, uh, for the section, and an icon is a, a plus icon that if uh, we can uh, choose this icon, appear uh, a section to, uh, for uh, to uh, create a record for to uh, create a record and create a tag. In, 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 the, in the top of the this section, there is a, a text field for entered a name. On the, on the right of the text field, uh, we can choose a group of, uh, of a tag, for instance, V, uh, E, or M. Okay, under the text field and the checkbox, uh, there, are, uh, there is a, a table for a mandatory field. And uh, under the table, there is two uh, drop down. In the first drop down, we can choose a header type, uh, for instance, name or title or rel or another item of the, of the drop down. And uh, on the on the on the left on the left of this uh, of this uh, drop down there is another drop down that uh, that show uh, some value the some value that's related uh, of uh, the uh, the first drop down uh, and yeah for instance if we can choose name in this uh, said in the second drop down there will be shown uh, name personal, name ente, nome congresso e convegno, or nome non controllato. When we choose on this, uh, on this item, uh, as you can, we can see, uh, a default value uh, we, uh, uh, is compound from uh, between the first and the second uh, drop down menu. At the bottom of this uh, drop down menu, there, there are uh, some uh, text field. The, the, the first and the second text field are fixed. Uh, in particular, the second text field represents the, the language field. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a last uh, text field, there is a, a dynamic field that, that uh, if we can choose on the text field, on the button at this subfield, 
on the layout uh, is that the uh, text field and the two uh, button open and cancel. Uh, on, uh, on, info, on, info item, uh, on info item on the left menu, uh, there was a simple uh, model, model uh, that represented uh, in accord with the UX design um, about uh, some information about CURT, about the catalog module. Uh, okay. Ah, okay. Uh, on the search uh, section, uh, for for the moment we can develop uh, an initial part of uh, search uh, search functionality and search uh, and search engine. Uh, on in the in the top right there's a, a gear icon, and when we can check, we can click this icon uh, that will be shown. Uh, a restriction panel. The restriction panel is a functionality related to uh, advanced search, but uh, for the moment it's work in progress. Okay, uh, for the, I think uh, for the moment uh, uh, that's all. Okay, thank you guys, thank you Kate, thank you all. Thanks, Christian. That was, that's an impressive amount of progress. It looks really good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Does anyone have questions? Oh. No, no. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. I guess there are no questions. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Thank you. And then we do have time for you, Jakob, for your platform slides before we wrap up. So I'll be very quick. Uh, I think we all, it's a long meeting for everybody. All right, so can I share my screen? Yep, it's freed up. All right. Is that, is that visible? Yes. All right. Very quickly, guys, starting with Okapi uh, authentication and RMB, so those core components. Uh, we have a new feature in Okapi that allows uh, for tenant cleanup operation. Now we sort of differentiate between two different kinds, hard cleanup and, and soft cleanup, where you can effectively release some resources um, like database connections. Um, that work has been done within Okapi 606 and 609. Uh, a lot of box success in Okapi. So that, that's really the only, the only new feature. A lot of box success are the right, uh, some interface, uh, tenant interface regressions fixed, um, problems with shutdown and others. Uh, you can also find more in Jira. Um, there's been some success to the pre and post filter, um, uh, support, uh, which was, uh, which was introduced in the previous Okapi version. Uh, I talked about that new feature, uh, during the last print review. It was slightly buggy. That's been resolved. Uh, authentication module. Uh, we are now controlling whether access to folio, um, uh, can happen based on the, the user status, uh, which was uh, previously used mostly for, uh, for controlling circulation. So whether the user can uh, can circulate items or like check check them out. Um, now that's also used for uh, for accessing accessing the system. RMB um, uh, work on implementing Raml 1.0 support. Um, it's getting there. It should be completed this week. Uh, most of the the blocking code has to do with uh, with logging um, and some other other minor issues. Uh, just a note on, about the, the support for Raml 1.0. The reason why it was a, a, a bigger task to introduce it was that we had to replace the parsing library, Raml parsing library that is used in RMB. So it's an entirely new library used for that. Um, uh, the old one did not support 1.0. Um, a couple of fixes in RMB essentially to address um, problems parsing big SQL queries, which we now generate for. Um, for the effective location search, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, an inventory module, uh, as you can could see from the demos, the, the RDA uh, dictionaries, uh, the bootstrapping with RDA dictionary data has been, has been completed. 
Um, we now have a fact of location support, so there's a new property uh, called a fact of location inventory, um, which is calculated based on a, on a simple algorithm. Um, uh, work on filtering uh, a fact of location is in progress. It was delayed because of the issues in RMB uh, I mentioned a second ago. Uh, now those issues have been resolved, so uh, that paved the way for, for the implementation. Uh, one more thing to um, uh, to address here is, is ability to filter out non distinct items um, so we don't get duplicate um, instance results. Uh, source record storage, uh, it's called complete, so there's a, a, a source storage in inventory and uh, ability to, to, to retain uh, the source record and the mode data loader. Um, and there's an integration effort um, ongoing this, uh, this sprint uh, to, to, to roll that out. Ability to assign multiple locations to service point, that's a minor thing that was also added. Um, circulation users back and completed UA modifications work with the new renewal API. Uh, so similarly to what we do, uh, what we did to checkout, uh, now the renewal process is controlled on the back end um, with this new API, and that API is being constantly extended to support um, uh, new policy types. Um, also support for effective location, similarly to inventory, uh, so the location property, um, uh, the sole location property and circulation is now uh, is now showing the effective location of the item. Um, and we're storing request cancellation information um, uh, for requests. Codex providers and multiplexers, there hasn't been much work, uh, actual work uh, going on uh, on the Codex uh, related modules, um, uh, but there's an effort um, uh, led by uh, Charlotte and, and Kalila um, to, uh, and to update the mapping um, from the Codex values to the new RDA based um, uh, dictionary values um, for material types and resource types. Uh, DevOps CI, um, uh, we are we keep on working on the Stripe CLI, integrating that with the build process and testing. So there's uh, there's been some progress there. Uh, new platform core, that's the new organization for uh, for defining folio platforms, which are used for building and test, uh, building and testing those uh, those environments uh, that we uh, that we run, like the testing and snapshot. Um, uh, so there's more sanity there, a new naming convention introduced for those. Uh, RMB also supports now expiry, expiry of um, database con connections, automatic expiry of database connections. Uh, that's based on the Fort SQL client, um, um, as the patch, the upstream patch is still pending for approval. Uh, support for bootstrapping module provided reference data, I mentioned that already, um, uh, for the RDA dictionaries. And uh, there's been some work uh, to allow that, uh, that bootstrapping happen for various modules. And you, you also saw that for, uh, for the acquisition modules. Uh, performance test environment integrated with Folio CI. Um, that's the joint effort from Wayne uh, and from the, our DevOps team and Hongwei from EBSCO. And uh, you've seen some of those results. It's looking really nice. Um, search performance. Um, uh, just quick updates. Uh, we've been working on, on Postgres full text support. Uh, the goal was to introduce the support uh, transparently um, uh, uh, from the point of view of the, 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 the front end modules, well, as transparently as possible. Um, uh, and all, what has been done is there is a, com a, a completed um, 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 uh, uh, um, version of uh, both RMB and uh, CQL to PG with some basic use cases. Uh, so all those testing use cases, uh, basic testing use cases that we uh, we set out to address. Uh, and there is a mod tags version, so the, the tag um, uh, maintenance module version that supports it. And it's been used as a test, but for that. And the plans are to uh, uh, to address um, uh, the more complex issues for searching for arrays and uh, and, and search across uh, different tables. Uh, those are two remaining items that need to be addressed um, uh, to uh, roll this out to inventory storage, which is really the the, the most critical modules for doing the full text search. And that uh, hopefully uh, happens this uh, this sprint. Um, 
documentation, new starter page for module developers that um, uh, David uh, started working on, and there's a general effort from David and Zach to, to review and, um, and, and, and address documentation gaps. Uh, plans for in Sprint 42, 43, so as I said, complete the initial version of the monthly storage with the Postgres full text support, um, uh, complete, uh, integrate the, the source record storage in inventory, and complete the filtering uh, by effective location uh, with, uh, with, um, with those um, duplicate problems addressed. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, Jakob. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, close the meeting. We're just a couple minutes over. I really appreciate everyone um, who attended and everyone who presented. I will send the deck out um, and the recording as well. And you can see the plans um, for next sprint for all of the teams in the deck as well, if you're curious what's, what's happening beyond um, what Jakob is showing here. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.